upcoming HDF happening in January 20, we're recording, in 2024. And so um, I just, I'm ex very excited. We're, our committee is very excited. We have an awesome event coming. It's the first year where we have an additional day. So things are going to be a little bit more spread out, which hopefully makes it even more enjoyable because sometimes it gets a little chaotic when we're doing so many different things in one day. So I hope and pray everyone takes this opportunity to have this educational experience here for the HDF Forum, but then also joining us and in, in joining in that excitement for HDF 2024. So Stacey, thank you very much for, for all of this and thank you for the HDF Forum. Thank you, Father, and thank you um, all for being here today. Um, I know that um, some of you had to rearrange dance practices and, and probably your days in general to be here. So, so glad that you could make that happen. And just um, as Father said, sort of a reminder of why we're doing this. Um, it's really for us a great opportunity to to touch base with all of you. Um, it's an opportunity for sort of group therapy, if you will, during this crazy time. Um, a, a touch point for us to come together and to remember why we're doing all this craziness. It's so easy to get our heads down and and get ready for competition, which is you know just over a month away, and to sort of lose sight of the bigger picture and why we're here. And so this is um, the the real point of being here today is is that. Um, to get us all excited about coming together live next month in Orlando. Um, and then also to be able to answer your questions, whatever um, might be on your mind that hasn't been answered or things that come up today. Um, so the format for today, I'll be introducing our presenter in just a second. He'll give a presentation for a, roughly a half hour. We'll have some time for a uh, question and answer regarding um, his presentation. And then we'll transition to talking with our committee and talk about the event and questions that you might have on your mind about the expanded event, the extra day um, competition. Um, we'll present with or present you with some um, new information too about things that are coming up that are new for 2024. So without further ado, I am so, so pleased to introduce our presenter for today. Um, he probably doesn't need much of an introduction in this group. Um, he's um, well known. We have with us from Yanana, um, Dr. Christos Papacostas. He is um, a, a very, very good friend of HDF in so many ways. He has um, served as a past judge. He is a, um, he has been so generous with his expertise, um, materials. Um, he's been here as a teacher for workshops for Anixi and to many of your communities as well. Um, again, he is just, um, a wealth of knowledge and has dedicated his life to to the research and the preservation of the things that we care about in this forum. Um, and he's just a pretty nice guy on top of it. He's really, truly one of, the, one of the most lovely human beings that um, that I know and I know many of us know. So, um, Christo, thank you so much for being here and um, for taking the time to prepare this for us today. And um, we just, we hope to see you live here very soon again. Uh, we hope we can welcome you, you back to, to the U.S. one of these days soon. Thank you. Thank you, Stacey. Thank you all. And yes, as always, I'm more than pleasure and, and, and the honor. And uh, as long as I can see happy faces, uh, because the cause and the reason is dance, this makes me very happy. I mean, uh, uh, honestly. So uh, I told to Stavros and, and uh, Stacey before that this, I think the last three years after pandemic, this is the most challenge, the most difficult lecture for me. And, uh, and I'm gonna explain it later or you're gonna understand it later. So always the challenge is about talking about dance is to find the balance between the, the frozen, uh, maybe boring <laughs> academic, uh, you know, uh, uh, way of presenting and something more mutual. I try to, to do both, but the first, and the, my main goal is to fire up the discussion and to, to, to share things with you. So I can share my screen. Can you see there this, this PowerPoint? Okay, okay. So, I mean, this is a very indicative title of my presentation, Greek traditional dance, before performance, challenges, and mostly thoughts. Or I think 
more more accurate is uh, more accurate is this what I realize and confirm and learn from HDF and FDF. So talking about uh, the concept of performance, okay, don't lose your mind in this, uh, you know, uh, scholar bullets, but keep keep that uh, in your mind. We talk about Greek tradition dance, a dance gen that raised and born in the community. So when we're talking about performance, mostly we have in our mind the Western concept of performance, the staging performance. It means have audience. This is a, the, the main and the most important contradiction in, in my point of view. And most of the people, the dance enthusiasts, professionals, even within the Greek academia, don't realize. Greek traditional dance it is not a theatrical dance. It's not ballet, it's not contemporary. It's for the community, it's for, for, made up for uh, the panigiri and, and the platea. But for historical reasons, we deal with that situation now. So, think about the, the main, another very important question, essential question is, if it is worthy of artistic use, uh, talk about the, the Greek traditional dance, sometimes it appears as a complex, talking about Greece. Always the people after the 50s struggle with this idea. Uh, it is worth it. To, it is an artistic. Uh, uh, it is an art or not. So this is be, because the exact position of the two distinct forms between the community and the spectacle. It's two different contexts, and of course, it's totally uh, impossible to do to bring the, the community dance and the community spirit uh, on stage. Now, about the background of this, let's say, conflict. Uh, this quotation comes from uh, a lady, Christine Mito from Likion Lidon, back in the in, uh, 30s. They realized that they need dance uh, in order to construct the, the neo-Hellenic identity, but they not they were not so sure about the aesthetics of dance. So always they would like to have another model in order to understand the aesthetics of dance. And that was and sometimes is uh, Greek antiquity. And Christianito says here, yes, it's very, it's very nice. The our Greek dances are very nice and beautiful, but it lacks like a lack, it lacks aesthetics, the movement, and the the movement of the Greek traditional dance is not exactly artistic. So it has not reached the highest stage of evolution that to be civilized, it's something like like Savage or Barbarian, need for ex-civilization with a measure of antiquity, need for further aestheticization. Talking about Lincoln Lidon that found it back in 1911. What about this period back in the in, uh, 20s? We have a mixture of different Uh, different styles and, and perspectives. They were like neoclassics from uh, European dance. We have the Russian avant-garde in, uh, in Paris with the Ballet Rouge, who, who is in 30s, very early. They use traditional motifs 
in ballet, if someone are familiar with uh, with ballet, uh, one of the the most or the newest, let's say, postures are arabesque. You can understand the meaning of that. But in Greece, we have a double shift from gymnastics to national dance. So they use the, the dance in the, in the school as in the, in the official dance curriculum in order to present the Greek identity. But the emphasis mostly is on the form rather the content of the cultural practice. And they don't pay attention or a little pay attention to the context. Now, this is, I think is the most, uh, I, my, my last interest scholarly is about the generation 30s. Igenia to Trianda, Seferis, Richos, people that you know, um, intellectuals, poets, authors, musicians, conductors. What, what about the generation? For them, it was the hardest to redefine the Greek national identity, identity because we lost uh, the war after the Smyrna catastrophe. If we should abandon our colonial dreams about you know the Greek of uh, uh, all over the Asia Minor. So what about what about Greekness? What about Elenikoita? We should look in the east, to the east or to the west. So that, that generation, they, they were very respect and to uh, traditional dance and traditional culture in general. But even them, they not looked very sure about their artistic, uh, the artistic character, character of dance or folk culture again in general. So Hazikiria Kuzikas was one of the most known, well known uh, painters of that generation, but <coughs> in Greece. A worthy dance tradition, but it makes sense within a revolutionary scene. It needs to evolve, it needs to be cultivated, and to be more aesthetic. My hypothesis is that Dora Stratu is direct contact and collaboration with many representatives of this generation. I have many friends uh, in this generation and also their way, their way of, um, of thinking and acting comes from this generation. It's again about the, the Hellenism. And just keep what about the relationship between the Greek and the European culture? For this generation of intellectuals, generally seen as a question of imitation, Europeanization of foreigners, while the generation of 30s showed creative dialogue and promoted the idea of cultural reciprocity. The search for Greek archetypal, which with some doubt how guarantee authenticity and in turn lead to Greekness, but also to modernity as a creative and renewal of tradition between the East and the West. The second border about the dance aesthetics was the Moiseyev way of uh, the Moiseyev school. And we're talking about, you know, let's say the socialistic uh, uh, nation states uh, after the other convention. Greek joined the West and the other Balkan uh, states joined the East and, and uh, the Soviet Union. But we have many, many, many contradictions. Because let's say in Bulgaria or Yugoslavia, and even more in Russia, 
ballet dancers train and practice in order to present and perform for dancers of their countries and their ethnicities of their countries. But here in Greece it was totally different. Dora Strato dancers come from village, was labor workers, and you can understand how how different cases were in comparison to the other Balkan states. But what's the, the main character of this uh, school, of Moise school, uh, say? Ballet training and folk dance. And now we have the, the so the, the concept of, of suite. I'm the, in this generation, a sequence of four or five dances. We talk about a larger number of uh, dancers. The suites and the dancers presented more physical, dynamic performance, more uh, fast, geometric space, straight lines, dynamical, dynamicals. We have like Italian st uh, style stage. So the dance action takes place opposite the audience. And we have uh, input of theatrical concepts. We can't turn your back at the audience. My, my teachers and I my, and myself used to say. But keep in your mind the three these concepts of grace, harmony, and homogeneity. The, 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 the main elements of this kind of aesthetics. But what does it mean grace or harmony and homogeneity is totally different from the community or to the stage? Let's say something. I know <laughs> nothing of that makes sense today, but this is part of our dance history. This is the Greek suite of the National Ensemble of Moiseyev, National Ensemble of Soviet Union. You can see the, the aesthetics and, and the main points, but you know, we usually, I dance more, not like that, but the whole suite and people from, I mean, all the people from uh, our parade to, uh, today, that's into this logic. So let's move forward. What about, about the performance on stage and the community? What about these relations? Even today for the Greek scholars or the people uh, of the Greek dance world, the community is the main source of dances for the composition of the repertoire, and as well, the source of inspiration. So the community functions as a place for collective aesthetic dances and satisfies the imagination and expectations of all kinds of specialists, teachers, collectors, and the lovers of tradition. Let's point out that an untouchable entirety in space and time and isolated. No count is taken of historical, social, economic transformations, migration, tourism, participation of communities in performances in states of early period, Metaxas celebrations, we'll talk about that later. So the community is like totally, even within Greece, something, an exotic place, a source of authentic dances. Take a look to this picture. This is the celebration in Delphi, Delphi Kies Vortes, 1930. Isadora Duncan, ancient tragedy, Agilus Irkilianos, his wife, Eva Palmer, I mean, totally high-end intellectuals. And what about this for here? This is the, 
the village of Vovusha in 1930. Yes, that's true. There is a whole story, I have the my says about that, how the, the government support Vovusha as a village to present the dances in the Fikes your days. You can understand how maybe it looks like from let's say intellectual culture of uh, modern dance of the Dora Daga choreographies and on the other side is the community. From the 30s the Vovusa still today it was a, it is very familiar with staging performance. In 60s Dora Stratu invite them uh, to the theater and they does the, there for two weeks and it's very famous the Vobusa suite it's very challenging very nice but let's see this video Always the question within you know my 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 colleagues and, and uh, other teachers, what about this choreography? It comes from the village, is the authentic one. After all those years, is a give and go. It's almost sure that Vovusa in the 30s and most possibly in the 60s in Dora Stratu, they were very aware of their choreography. They did that in the choreo, the big new things of presenting dances from the Rastrato in this context of, uh, from let's say from the city, and get them and bring them back to the Bobusa. And actually Bobusa is totally, is two, two hours car drive from Yanina. So I think, or not I think, I'm sure that None of the art communities that we consider as isolated never been there, never worked like that. Uh, also, we are now in the context of now Hellenic dance festival, folk dance festival competitions. Does make sense uh, a competition in Greece? You know, all, most of my, my colleagues in Greece are very, you know, skeptical and sometimes overcritical about competitions for Greece and also for, for the States. They exaggerate, I think. But we have kind of uh, competitions in early 80s. This is, do you agree that this is a great material for my group, for my university, but for your groups in order to bring that uh, dances on stage for HDF or to get, and get an award? This is the, the first is in the 80s dance competitions in Zagori within six, seven villages of Zagori. Bogusa is one of them. This is the, the, the dance group from Ella Fotopos. Cervari is the old name. It's the Gregoris Capsalis uh, Villas, the well-known clarinet player. They get the first prize here, the first award. And now, always the question is, what about these ladies? Are, are they traditional dancers or not? In their times they were, and they are traditional dancers, but keep this in your mind. For this competition, they did practice every week. 
and also they choreograph themselves. So a whole village, because of the situation, acted like a full group. Just think about these dynamics. What about another now relationship between authentic community and performance? Do you know any any of you who is dance dance group is that? This is people from from the Ropoli. And now that Bogoni became very popular, and that, that's very, very, very good. Let's let's say a very short story. The Ropoli for dance group. Was a very uh, sister, for for instance, they they dance for in the Argyro Castro International Folk Dance uh, Festival for years. They are very familiar with the way say the wave of staging and this you know more expressionist Eastern way ballet kind of uh, folk dance presentation. And when they they dance the Albanian. Uh, nation uh, state participate in uh, dance competitions in Europe. One of the first and the most significant four dance suite to present Albania was the Ropoli. In this style, and also dance Armenaki in Mekiramu and Karaguna. So, what is authentic, not authentic? And the more traditional and the clear and the clean, it's always in question. The latest competition, dance competition in Zagori, they tried to revive the old one, was before the pandemic in 2019. So again, performance on stage and the community, the dance is perceived as fully identified with the place, local and, cut and cultural historical context are not taken into account unless they fully confirm the intentions of the Russian state. Keep a title in mind. They, they, the four groups back then, they can't, they cannot dance Turkish, uh, Turkish speaker uh, dances from Cappadocia, Slav speaker, not even Arvanites. Otherwise, purification from single and foreign elements as far as national identity is concerned, concerned is considered imperative. So just one dance that totally confirm the national state building and identity. Well, this photo is from Calibrisi Drama, 1994. Uh, the thing is, okay, you have uh, the strong pole of national state and the communities technically is the, the weak pole. This uh, photo taken again in 1994 has the, the ethimo of uh, the gamos, the waiting, which is like parody of waiting. Bride and groom are, are men, both men, and January 8th. But this figure of the Vachus, the Dionysus, is new. It's the first time that this figure appears in the Ethimo. Why? Because all the natural, the, the national literature, uh, even the academic folklore, and the hegemony, the hegemony of the discourse of national state is that. All this kind of ethema comes from the, the ancient Greece. And because they, they also they found, archaeologists found a temple of Dionysus in Calibrisi, they did that equation. 
from ancient Greece until now are the same. So first time and now from 1994, they always they have a guy that dressed up like, like Dionysus. So you can understand and realize the challenges of uh, dance scholar, of a researcher, how, how difficult it is to, to, to find things. What about teaching? Teaching, talk about, about Greece, because you'll see later, I think HDF and FDF is ahead of that. We think in Greece, I mean, my scholars, teachers, friends, were interesting to do something natural, to teach the natural dance. This is totally ironic and impossible. It is being promoted as the conceptual equilibrium of authenticity during the teaching phase. Utopia. How will traditional dance dancers be trained if they have no traditional dance experience? The social and cultural construction of the body, we dressing, we talking, we walking differently. But we like to have in our mind the romantic illusion of, of the one and the only traditional style. And think and always I'm when I'm addressing my, my students at the university. But you know, okay, this is traditional, this is authentic. But even in, in HDF in, in the States, your dancers, your students just have just one body to address. Yours as a teachers. Ένας δάσκαλος, δέκα μαθές. So the teaching is totally mimic. I'm seeing and I'm doing the one body. Okay, my teacher is very experienced. He did his, uh, his her research. Okay, and he know how that, you know, in Carpenese you have 25 different styles of chamico. More or less, we did like a strategic decision to pick just one or two to teach in order to present this material, in order to, to put this material on stage. So again, between the form and the content, they always drive me crazy. Well, not you, I think, especially your uh, advanced senior category. The form is above all. How the dance it looks like. Nobody cares about the context, the historical, the cultural, or even to realize. Again, I insist, guys, on that. Our students have the chance to see just one, two, or three different bodies, or one, two, three, four, at the most styles. Think about that. Think about authenticity. So I, I'm I coin this name. I use this name of post-traditional dancers. I always use the, the second bullet, my second bullet, my friend and my student, Theoni. I mean, she knows, she knows Theoni. Theoni is from Pizagori. Here, yeah, yeah, Papus was like, let's say, traditional dancers. She dances in the four dance groups in, uh, in Yanina for ages. When I or I ask her, how do you feel? We are mostly, you know, uh, a dancer from the from dance group. We had to move over to the left because we can't turn around. We can you hear me? Hello. So I think you're muted. Now, can you hear me? 
Yep, we got you. What was my, my last line? <laughs> <laughs> you were talking about Theoni. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So I asked Theoni, how, how do you feel? You born and raised in a traditional dancers environment, and you are a kid of Horeftika, of four dance groups. You know, you are right. When I'm, I'm, I present myself in, in Panigiri, my body mostly acts and respond as a student from Fortax Group, not from Panigiri. You know how, how, how contradictory is that? So this issue becomes more apparent when the dancers think about the dancers' bodies and the TV shows uh, uh, like Stine Yamas or even a lot of these years. Where I'm looking, where do I stop, when I close, where my audience. So, and this is more obvious in some kind of dances. I tend to, to name that like Lego dances, that we have motives that constructed the community in a traditional way, but not in a certain order, like no, Sis Maria's, the Mitrula from from uh, from Gidas, that every woman did their her own stuff, and even let's say Kiria Maria dance Gida on Monday, they, she gonna do differently on Sunday. So, what about kind of offbeat dances like Steriani or from Thessaly or Galeazzo in Crete? Let's. What I'm, I'm trying to, to say is that. classic teaching experiment of mine here in the university, especially for the people that uh, would like to, to study dance teacher. Hey, uh, professional, this is offbeat. This is offbeat. So the, the, what they have in their minds, the Western concept of beat. One step, one movement, on beat. Seriani, for these ladies in Magula Kardica, is their own stuff, is in a free rhythm. Nobody cares about the Western concept of, of rhythm. What, they, what really happens in teaching, they try to do the choreography uh, and the politically correct. One and two and three on beat. Doesn't work like that in the community. And also, now there is a great debate between uh, two major categories of the dance teachers in Greece. The one that have like degrees is me, and the other comes from the community, and they they consider themselves as viomatiki. I can. Maybe you can help me with that. Viomaticos, Vioma. There's one, just one, you know, uh, translation in in English, like experience. But in Greece, it's different. Vioma from Iberia. So what do you mean that? Because I'm coming from a community, I I can consider myself as a teacher as well. But again, think the same way like the, the relationship between the performance, the stage performance, the community. Even the bodies and the dances that we have in our minds as totally authentic and coming from experience uh, and untouchable from other kind of influence, even that case, in my point of view, doesn't work like that. So,
Plutarchus can do this. You know, you know, some of them. Actually, I don't know. Uh, he does with Sandy Papadopoulos in FTF back in the 90s, I think. They get the, the sweeps the egg. Plutarchus is a great dancer. Tas is his dance. But you can see some or many movements that, you know, maybe doesn't fit to the ideal podium. The, the body is not only the natural body, you have this, our social body, we have many different inscriptions and personal histories. And also, Rutherford dance like that. This is a, a very old Greek movie. We can discuss about that. I know maybe it's too much information for you, but I think you got your question. My main point, nothing. I'm not sure for uh, nothing. <laughs> well, this is another video filmed from uh, Dennis Boxel in 80s in Vavakofi to Ceres. Karada Vasi, beautiful dance, old style. Back then, Babakovido, they didn't have a folk dance group. Then, uh, Nikos Kulialis, bless memory, take over the folk dance group. And they should have to do very critical decisions. Babakovido used to be a Slav speaker village. So even in 1995, uh, they invite Papakofi to dance in Herodion, in, in, uh, in Athens. And because it's my material, I have uh, interviews from, from Nico, where we were very good friends. I told him, Nico, what about Argigaita? What that kind of dance is that? Let's hear some. The same dance, Karada Vasi. I think you it's easy to notice that a whole village of traditional, let's say, dancers dance as a full group, not as a village, because it's a stage performance. The other, where is the first part, the second part of Karada Vasi? The behind story is that because it's Turkish name. Nikos decided not to do the second part for two or three years and, and to rename this dance as Archigaida. Again, how many different things should the dance scholar and dance researchers do to think about and dance director? And there are another example. Vagilisa from Molakas. <laughs>
just to, to, to make some, some humor, that the last decade, huge debate about how many hopes Vangelisa has. Two, three, two and a half, two, two point seventy five. What happened about that? Here again, the, the first dancer, Marigula, is ninety years old. I think it's, she's still alive. Sometimes doing two or three. And now you should think. When they dance in Gaida, things are more clear. All these hiccups happen when they, they dance in their own voices. Why? Because they, they another ex love speaker village, when they say Agapi have three syllables in Greek, Lube in Slavic has two. So they try to fit in everything. And it was very, very strategic decision for, the, for her for all of these women. And also, of course, they don't care if they are doing two or three hops or something in between. But they they do know what they should do in order to, to break and perform the local community style. So teaching, performance, and homogenity is a very important trio in Greek traditional dance. How this homogenization achieved in in, um, in Greece through seminars, workshops, andamomata like Vlachiko andamomata gatherings, Strakachani gatherings, villages like Vavokovito on stage, totally different. They acting, actually they play the role of themselves. And also, have another kind of dilemmas about teaching performance and aesthetics. Listen to that. It's a very nice song. Kita me glikya magapi, kita me glikya. Kita me kita proti magapi, si me Κοίτα πρώτη μ' αγάπη, σήμερα είμαι εδώ. The same song, and it's mother tongue. Γλέντα η μα γλέντα, γλέντα η μα γλέντα, αχ παρβουλιούμπε, γλέσκα σαν τούκα. Βερνάει η σόγκ του Ξηροπόταμος. The people themselves and the teacher back to the 80s for, you know, uh, for ethnic reasons, it was very hard to, it was impossible to, to sing in, in, in Slavic, they translate, but this, they translate the, the lyrics, this music, the first one in Greek became very uh, famous, they played for, different fusion uh, groups. That's very, very, very positive. I think the one characterizes artistic, the other like more like artless or dirty. So many people, they use the first, the first one than the other one. And now, and you know, I know the time is it's running. So about this debate about the dirty and the clean, the only thing, another thing that drives me crazy in Greece is that we don't have like safe criterion to think the same for the same regions, for the same thing, for the same dances. But I'm, well, the, this is the music and the dancing I love and I'm here, so. <laughs> For the most of the people of uh, the Greek dance world and college of mine have great conflicts on that. 
this is uh, very dirty and dirty and savage and uh, you know barbaric in in a way. The the same music gen, Cabicho, when it performed in the mountains in Siraco here in Black Village in Indiana. <laughs> This is authentic, not the first one, this is authentic. The same scale, the same music channel. And the last. <laughs> Kazimishotiko is a dance from uh, some villages between Laris and Volos. People dance like that. This is uh, a, a made up music in the 40s, in the 50s, became very, very popular. And people respond to that, that they like very much many, many villages. When I'm, I'm, I'm using that, uh, that uh, music, most of my colleagues say that this is not for stage. Fortunately, to your advanced senior in the FDF, things change, and this is for good. But when the same dance passed through the filter of the uh, television and the, this kind of broadcast, So the first case is uh, first case is acceptable. Uh, is not acceptable. The same. The second it is. So come to the last last uh, just two more uh, slides. What I believe and what I learned for that. This is my. That's why I told you in the beginning of my 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 speech my presentation. That was very challenging for me. Greek dance is much more than we believe that it is. So the Greek dance world, more than a network, is a web of affinity, a community of practice. Members are related through the learning process, the love and the passion. It receives from cognitive process to more inclusive realm of social practice. Interaction, they recognize each other and negotiate their status on the basis of their common practice. Think about their job as a directors or dancers. That is beyond their love for dance. They share codes, experiences, stories, social, sociability, psychotherapy, reproduction of relationship, the most, the most important my point of view. Give meaning to our life, to your life, it brings collectiveness and solidarity. And think about the great value during the, the pandemic and the post-pandemic era. Through the, the practice of performance, the Greek dance community, the Greek dance world community, acting like community and support teachers, dancers, and musicians. My thoughts. So, and it's not like it's my my literally from my bottom of my heart that thought says what's the vision now hdf or hdf should be like just an event it isn't it's another competition in a competitive uh, way of life for me i'm talking about because that i learned from that i confirm my theory in the stage we should focus to the aura of dance what dance does, makes in HDF, FDF, diaspora world in Greece. I am, I strongly believe to see it in a more dirty and natural approach of teaching and staging. We need more inclusivity. This is my proposal, maybe. You should include older people 
to HDF community, people with special needs, people who need support. The Gladys process, I know that very high in FDF and SDF. Keep it that way and make it stronger. Maybe it's utopia to, to pass from mimesis to methexis. Improvements and modifications to just manual criteria and scoring system. I think it's, you already think about that. Year-round collaboration, commitment, connection between diaspora and patrida projects, exchanges, scholarships. My department started, we to do something. We consider publications, summer schools, and hopefully a master degree. This is my, this is my vision, but I don't know what's going to happen. Year round, judges, discussions, and training. You know that, that line? I have that video from 19th century. Now it's not enough anymore. Greek dance performances and aesthetics improve so much, especially your advanced senior category, that just all material, all YouTube material, or just a connection to dance experts, that all people to the Horyo is not enough anymore. HDF, FDF, or in general, we need social events archives, video, audio, books, and live stories. So, to end up, I perceive and understand now dance in my mid 50s as a common, as a common good. Sarana Kino. And to put it in a more theological way, some Doro and some Adidoro. Thank you very much. And I also believe in that. Krista, thank you so much. I feel like a lot of us could sit here for hours and take just even one slide and talk for a long time about um, our opinions, experiences. But um, I think just super, for those of us who have been um, around even for a little while, we've seen an evolution. But to be able to go back even farther and to understand the nuances and the variables that affect the things that we do and to realize that not just our responsibility to material, whatever we find, but it's also a responsibility for us for the next step, what happens after and part of that and our part in that evolution, which is something that's so important to think about, but it was super, just really excellent. Thank you so much for your insight. And Basically, just one moment, just to, to drop yeah. interrupt you. Yeah. For my last, I'd like to be very clear and very honest. For my last uh, slides, I'm not talking as an authority. I'm not talking as an academic. It's what, you know, this is what, it was my, my what I was believe about dance. And ironically, I found my theory Crossing the Atlantic. That's why. No, no, no. We, we <laughs> it came across that way. I mean, you you are an authority, but also it's obviously very personal. And and we um we we're this this bridge that we've talked about a lot is what's so important to all of us. So um I do want to open the floor to anyone who might have a comment or question. I do have one that was given to me, but um if anyone would like to unmute um and and jump in, you're more than welcome. Hi, this is Christiana. I just wanted to ask a question to when you talk about the Glendy process, when it says mimesis versus methexis, what does that mean? From just do, doing steps and uh, mimic steps, just to find our way to express ourselves through the community spirit uh, and through the, the Glendy process. Methexis is like to, to, learn, to, to learn yourself. To lose yourself to the music, to lose yourself to the ballet, to lose yourself to dancing. Justice is another state of mind. Thank you. <laughs> Anyone else? Um the, this question, I think you have, you this came to me a little bit ago, but it's, and Christo, I think in your last slide you sort of addressed it. Is that, you know, what is this is the question? How do we pay homage to the way Greeks traditionally present dance in performances and in villages, um, while showcasing the village properties in the context of competition with such limited time? So, in other words, I guess maybe the maybe a way another way to ask that is in your in the 
maybe maybe you've seen a group do present something particularly well and in a way that is um that that gives that gives that homage to the to the village what what do you think they've done differently than other groups to make that happen that's a very very hard question i don't know it's it's it, it's very hard the first thing that I should realize and uh, the teachers uh, the, the, the directors the dance program in general is the preparation for me personally even as a judge for my personal criteria um uh, the thing I would like to do is like the time the time and the space of of the of this uh, of this set where when and even they, they, they perform differently I I I do prefer I tend to prefer more uh the group that have more spontaneous uh movement and, and acting that than the a group that are very very well prepared very well trained and very uh, pay attention more to the technical elements let's say but I, I, I prefer I tend to prefer the first the first one actually and uh, just to, we have like you have examples now I can I use your examples in my lectures so uh, now I can see now, now Bobby uh, uh, Thraki from Philus uh, Kriti from Bobby Pogoni uh, uh, from Dean and um, uh, the, the work of Contos and many other people, especially in Avant Senior, became like a trend, but it's not by chance that the people that you know introduced that state uh, that way of you know of, of staging I have more stronger or less stronger but strong connection, let's say to the source. Or they can use the, the best way the material they, they, they have. Thank you. Is there any anyone else before we're gonna scoot on in the interest of time um, to the second piece of this? Um, Christo, I'm assuming that you're not gonna be upset if I give out your contact information if anyone has questions. <laughs> not at all, I would be very happy, very happy. Okay, so everyone, just so you know, what this has been recorded and it will be posted to the YouTube channel. Um, and uh, Christo has always been generous um, with answering questions. If you'd like to watch it back or if you think of something later, um, don't hesitate to reach out. Um, but before I move on, just um, a virtual round of applause for Christo and, and a big thank you for, for your insight okay. and presentation. Thank for you. Me. Thank you. Great challenge again. I'm like... <laughs> You met the challenge. That was a when is that? Um, what year was that, Stavro? Challenge accepted. That was our a theme a long time ago for HDF. Twenty what? Fifteen. Oh. That might have that might have been Charlotte. I think that might have been. I bet you Bobby remembers. Bobby remembers everything. Because I don't remember. Really remember I don't remember <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so uh, we're gonna move on to um, the the. HDF 2024, um, part of this presentation um, slash Q&A. Um, if Stavro would um, sort of take a second to uh, recognize the executive board and the FIT members that are in attendance, and then we'll move on to some some talk about the actual event. So Stavro, I'm gonna let this, let you take it from here. All right, everyone. Um, thank you all for joining once again. Um, we're really excited to have you all with us. Um, thank you. Uh, Christo for a great presentation, but also thank you to you all for joining us as we pay homage to dance, but also get excited for HDF here in just about a month. Um, HDF is going to be this year on January 11th through the 15th. We've been planning tirelessly, and I'd like to recognize and just thank some of the people that are on here that are on the HDF committee. Um, Father Sampson's obviously our chair. Myself, Stacy, our director of competition, Eleni Hopes. I believe these are the members on here today. Um, so I'd like to thank them all for everything that they do. And um, we're planning an exciting event for you all. So we are getting ready for Orlando, fun in the sun in Florida. 
Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about the um, how the difference, uh, how what what the schedule is going to look like, and how it's going to be different this year with the extra day, and then also some add things that we've added throughout the weekend? Yes. So um, as you all know, HDF is now an extra day. Um, so this was a big change for us, um, but I think it's something that was definitely much needed, especially considering the number of groups we have coming to HDF this year. We have a record 68 groups um, at HDF this year. Um, that's eight, 19 more than last year. So um, it's definitely a big jump in participation. And we're thankful for that extra day to allow all of us to hopefully take a little bit of a breather and still be able to enjoy the event, but also have more time for fellowship and kind of the stuff that we're, Caruso was talking about towards the end of his um, presentation of that community and connectedness and us all working together. So um, HDF will be on for, be for four days and we'll start on Thursday. Um, Thursday will look like a typical first day at HDF with registration practice and opening ceremonies, um, followed by the director's meeting. So we, you all are mostly directors. So we ask you all to please be in attendance for that. Um, competition will go as follows. So on Friday, we'll have our entire semifinal round of competition for all of the categories. So. Um, that will go pretty much all day long till about 8 p.m., um, followed by Eglandy that evening. And then on Saturday, we will start off the final round of competition. So we'll actually have all of the groups through the senior category perform on Saturday. Um, an advanced senior category will not perform on Saturday. Um, so everyone else will perform. Again, that will take all day, essentially. Um, and we also have the division three competition. We have eight exhibition groups that will be eight or nine. I can't remember right now. Uh, eight. We have eight exhibition groups that will be performing on Saturday. Um, we also have one, just to backtrack a little bit for Friday, I, I skipped something, but we have an exhibition group that will be performing right at the start of the advanced senior semifinal, and it's going to be a performance by Kiklos. Um, if any of you have heard of Kiklos, they're from Thessaloniki, um, one of our judges, Kiriakou Moisidis. Um, and some of the other judges are part of that as well. They're bringing their dance group to do a special performance for all of us here at HDF. So that will take place on a Friday afternoon. Um, following the competition on Saturday, we will have a new event, which I'd like to talk about just a little bit, um, that's geared towards all of you all here. And we'll be having a director social out on the pier that overlooks the convention center. Um, the idea is just for us to all get together and in a spirit of camaraderie, talk together. Um, get to know each other. A lot of us have been involved in this for many years. Other of us, others are new to this. Um, and we want to kind of extend the hand to make every, sure everyone feels part of the HDF family. So with that, from 7.30 to nine on Saturday, um, we'll be having a director social um, and all our judges, our judging panel will be invited as well. And following that, we'll have our landing. Um, on Sunday, we'll have um, church in the morning and then we'll have the division to, excuse me, the division um, division two final round of competition, which will be the um, advanced senior category. That's all of our older people. Um, and then in the evening, we'll have the award show followed by a Glendie. Um, so we're really excited for HTF this year. We're back again at the Caribe Royale. I think it was a great spot for us. We'll be pretty much the only main group there. So kind of taking over the entire hotel. So we're excited for all of us um, to get together. Um, I don't know if anyone has any questions or if I met Stacey, did I miss anything? No, I think you got everything. If anyone has questions about the weekend oh. schedule. The one thing, that was the one thing I was gonna say. So um, we're still finalizing the weekend schedule, um, workshop schedule and competition schedule. Competition schedule obviously come out the latest. Um, however, the next week or two, um, you'll be getting an email on our social media and website will be updated with our weekend and workshop schedule we've scheduled a lot of workshops this year not just spiritual but also instrument workshops and other types um, that will be more conducive to learning um, so we'll be putting all that information out very soon um, competition schedule will work as soon as possible to get it out to you um, we're hoping to do it very soon after the deadline um, the portal deadline on the 15th um, but Pay attention, pay attention for those things. Um, obviously, social media is the best way to keep in constant contact with what's going on with things. HDF will try to put things out pretty much every day. Um, and I think that's all I have.
I did see a note here for about the Kiko's performance, and I'm sorry I did I did miss that. That there are three judges that are part of the Kiko's performance. It's um, Yanni Amaranti, Luis Kiriakou, Moises, and Rena Carrillo So all three of them will be participating in the performance as well. <clears throat> okay, perfect. Um, and guys, don't don't hesitate. You guys can reach out or uh, um, unmute and ask questions anytime, even if you talk over us, it's okay. Um, I'm gonna just go ahead and move into my section, which is more competition related um, and just highlighting a couple of things that are in the pipeline. Obviously I've been in contact with all of you guys a lot. I try not to spam you, but sometimes it's necessary. Um, one thing that's new this year is that, um, so we've asked, um, and Dimitri Papa Dimitri, who many of you know from Atlanta, has joined our fit, our fit team um, as the AV liaison, which has been a huge, huge um, help to us. Um, and his job is is obviously to liaise with the with our AV crew um, to hopefully make things go smoother during the competition, to make things run more on time, and on, and just to have um, the AV team really in tune with what you guys need for your performances to bring your visions to life. Um, and so, in that vein, we will be sending out tomorrow uh, a new form. I know there's very simple information that you fill out via the portal about your AV. Um, Dimitri has put together a Google form. It's like a questionnaire um, with a lot more detail about what you might be needing, what kind of uh, instrumentation you have for your, for your shows. Um, that will come out tomorrow and that will also be due on the 15th with the rest of your information. It's not a lot of work, but it's enough that you should pay attention to it probably in advance of the 15th um, because you may need to be in touch with your musicians um, to probably get some of that detail um, correct. Um, not all of us are um, well-versed in all the technical terms and, and, uh, and mics and this and that. So I would definitely, when it comes out tomorrow, I would encourage you to take a look at it as soon as you can. And then, um, sort of get with your musicians if you're using live music, which most of us are. Um, so, um, that's something you can look out for tomorrow and we'll, that will go directly to Dimitri. So he'll be your point of contact. Of course, I'm always here to help, but he'll be the direct contact for that information. Um, Another thing I wanted to highlight, um, and I'm just gonna pull up, we we added, so we made a slight change to the way costumes are judged this year. Um, and we did it mainly because we saw some deficiencies in the way that, um, that well, the way people approach costumes are, are different, right? Not everyone has the same resources, not, even, not everyone even has the same, um, they don't put the values on the same things necessarily. Like some people really want the experience of having someone in their community to sew, which is wonderful. Some people uh, have great relationships with costume makers abroad and, and use those resources. So the costumes that are on stage at HDF are wide and varied. Um, and so we wanted to give an opportunity to make sure that that all of those efforts are recognized in, in a more powerful way. So I'm just gonna quickly share that all of this information has already been in the, the weekend manual. So if you've looked at it at all, hopefully um, you'll, you've seen some of this. Um, but basically um, the right, the main costume award, which is what we're all used to if we've been around is, is largely the same with the exception of the fact that it will actually be given a numerical score. So in the past, it's it's been sort of something that's a little more nebulous. It's talked about amongst the costume judges. Um, they take a lot of notes during during the competition, but now there'll be actual scores attached to the, to the main costume award, which is one per category. And that criteria, as you can see here is, um, scored in two different um, sections. One, how well do the costumes align with the region village timeframe of the, of the material being performed? And then a second um, section on presentation. Are they well fitting? Are they neat? Um, are they of good quality fabric and detail? Um, Borrowed costumes are not considered for that award, um, but these are the basically the criteria for that. What we've added new for this year is uh, what we're calling, let's see, the St. Tabitha Special Achievement Award for Costumes. And for this, it will not be by category, but rather there will be up to two given per division. So up to two for division one, up to two for division two. Um, and this, cr the criteria for these is for um, outstanding community made reproductions or costume pieces and or incorporation of antique or authentic costumes or costume pieces. So this is more to recognize again, that um, that effort um, that was put into either something sewn within your community 
Or um, if you've ta- if someone just is has been able to get their hands on an authentic bridal costume from from somewhere, right, and and makes a special effort to bring that and put it on stage for their uh, for their performance, then that would be considered for this award. So it sort of gives an opportunity for um, for all of all of those efforts to be recognized in a different way. And we hope that you'll kind of take a look at that and, and think if you're looking at your costumes more critically, um, maybe how that would fit in to what you're doing. Um, the idea behind all these changes really is just to make everyone um, push forward um, on, on a track that is uh, that is positive and, um, and, and gives more thought behind. I think costumes in some ways have been um, an afterthought for some people that's makes sense because we were worried about dancing. Um, but it is such an integral part and we wanna make sure that we're doing our best to make sure that it's recognized the right way. Um, so that's all for me on the competition side. Any questions about those items? Okay. Jordan, you're still here? I am. Super. Jordan is our um is our judging coordinator on the fit team. He's um in his is this your second year, right? Second year coordinating, yes. Super. So um Jordan, if you would take it away and just give us just a, a quick um intro on who the judging panel is this year and um a, a refresh on the scoring changes. You got it. I love being quick. So uh, the main two that I wanted to mention with the judging panel, the two new faces that people will see is uh, Dina Triandos from Long Beach, California, and Yanis Amarantidis from Thessaloniki, who are coming to be our costume judges. Uh, the rest of the judges will be the same familiar faces. Mine, Dina Dallas, Peter Blahakos, Stacey Zumberaikis, Aris Yortzidis, Dimitri Tashi will make a jump over to dance, uh, Rena Cariofilidu, Kiriakos Moisidis, Joe Graziosi, um, Adi Shortidis, I said, hopefully everybody, there'll be 10 judges. If I forgot them, they know there's nothing personal, but I'm actually on my way to the airport right now. But in any case, one of the things I talked about at Annexy at the HTF forum is, uh, and I'm glad actually Cristo mentioned it in his last slide where he talked about us constantly making improvements to the scoring and the judging panel in general. And I just kind of wanted to, to reiterate on that, that it's not necessarily changes that are made because there's been deficiencies in the past it's just changes that are made because if you're not moving forward or you're being stagnant and nothing is improving and we're i know as hdf on the committee in general we're always striving to improve and uh as christo mentioned too there's really dancing is not an exact science so we're doing our best uh what i would like to say is uh, speaking on behalf of the judges myself included obviously we are very comment based i know that comments are like gold for directors i've been in the director's seat before so we do our best to try to uh, to make cohesive, helpful comments because I know that it, it's it's a process, right? Nobody wants to come and bring a suite of dances one year that they feel just absolutely gets destroyed, and then they have no uh, positive reinforcement or good good criteria or or help uh, to improve it the following year. So I promise that we do our best. It's it can be a little difficult when you're sitting at the table and we're we're writing as much as we can in the time that's given to us. But uh, that being said. To kind of alleviate the the scoring crunch, we changed the scoring system this year to a more rank-based system. And it's not necessarily because the past system was so bad or so broken, as some people may want to believe. It's more that it uh, unifies the system in that where in the past, judges might have different scores. So people won't understand that like, oh, you know, Judge A gave me an 8 on this chance but Judge B gave me a 5.5. Like, what did I do wrong according to Judge B? And it's not always so simple as that because the highest number Judge B may give could be a six or a seven. So a 5.5 is actually very high. Um, it's been difficult to explain that because obviously as the judging coordinator and you know uh, a member of the Metropolis of Atlanta, a lot of people have me on speed dial, I feel. So they, they sit there and they call me about it and they ask me all these questions and I can't necessarily speak for other judges. So basically the way that this is gonna work is that the judges will score the same way and then it will be a rank-based system. So for example, just like a, a rough explanation, if there's 10 groups in a category, for me judging, my number one group will get a score of 10, and number two will get a nine, and number three will get an eight, and so on and so forth. And that way, my first place group is worth the same amount, theoretically, as the other judges' first place group. So uh, you know, a group one cannot be a 10 to one judge and a six to another. 
that being said, it was never really a broken system in the past, simply because, as I mentioned before, uh, a judge is consistent in that I'm not going to give typically a 10 to one group and that my, they're my top group. And then in another category, I'm going to give a six. That's my top number. So there were always consistencies, but just for the sake of everybody's peace of mind and to know that every. Uh, has an easy possible system that we're going to be to be going to, because I know that I've gotten a lot of questions, too, that they'll get uh, judges will or directors will get like the aggregate scores of what they did the, the year before, which was already times the percentage. And they're like, how did this suite get a two point five? And I've had to explain to them, no, it didn't really get a 2.5. You actually probably got something closer to a six or seven on average, but that's four five percent of your average score. Because So uh, I hope that this is clear as mud. Obviously, I'm always approachable for questions. I like to, to maintain transparency. We'll probably cover all of this all over again briefly in the director's meeting the weekend of HDF. Um, but I would always like to use this opportunity as any opportunity to reiterate to directors that it is incumbent upon you to be sure that the kids are enjoying themselves and that the weekend overall, especially now we have an entire extra day and that extra day doesn't necessarily mean that we're an extra day on stage. I've told groups before that I was like, you go there now for three and a half days and the amount of time you're actually spending on stage is 25 minutes. So what are we going to do for the countless other hours that were there? And we really should be taking everything in that the weekend has to offer us, which is there's a lot of fantastic musicians that come from Greece. There's a lot of knowledgeable people that are there. There's spiritual workshops to do. And then there's also an extra night of Glendia that we get to enjoy with these musicians. So go out there, enjoy everybody else's company and have a good time because we're with like-minded weirdos that love Greek dances as the next person. So um, again, I'm always approachable for questions and I don't want to hold everybody here all the time, but uh, we'll discuss all these things again. And I can't wait to see people in a few weeks. So that about wraps it up. And again, I apologize to any judge that I may have forgotten when I was going off the list. Like I said, I'm in the car right now and I, I didn't write this down. No, I think I think you got them all. Thank you so much, Jordan. Does anyone have questions for Jordan? Put him on the hot seat. We love putting Jordan on the hot seat. Please. I love being on the hot seat. <laughs> going once. Okay. Super. You guys know we're all here. So I, hopefully you'll use us as, as you need us. And I, I do want to say a big thank you to you guys for being, you, you guys are really on it with getting your rosters in. And I know that's a hard week, uh, Thanksgiving week to get information in, but you guys did amazing and um, it, it really helps. So hopefully you all received your category assignments and you know, your time limitations. Um, the 15th guys where, where, where is the big um, deadline. So it's a week from this Friday. That's when everything is due to the portal when you have to hit the scary submit button. Um, so, um, just, um, make sure if you, um, if you feel like you're going to have, um, questions, maybe to get in there again, I would, I would highly recommend getting in there before the 14th, um, so that you can, um, get questions answered or any technical difficulties, um, get with me. Um, and I would be very happy to help you always. Um, but like Jordan said, I am so excited guys. We're barely a month away. So, um, I really, it's going to be so great to have a little bit of extra time, um, just to spend together. Um, and I really look forward to seeing all of you. And I always say this, if, if I am like running down a hallway and like super not looking into what I'm doing, please stop me and say hello, because I, I, a lot of times don't get to see you guys in person, um, and to give you a hug and just to say hello. So make sure you stop me if, if, if we haven't had a chance to say hello, um, in Orlando. Um, but thank you again to all of you for being here. Thank you to Christo for an amazing presentation and for all that you do for us and continue to, and we hope to continue to build that, that community, um, that you talked so eloquently about. So thank you all. If father, are you still on to close us out? It was more than pleasure and donut and, uh, see you soon. I think he left. Okay. So. Okay. Perfect. All right. Thank you all. Have a wonderful evening and um, God bless your test. We will see you guys soon. Take care. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Bye. Yes, really. Thank you. Bye.